Good afternoon, everybody, and uh, welcome to um, our webinar. Um, my name is Callum, calling from Sustainit, and um, today uh, we're joined by um, Colin Curtis as well as Colin Grant from Figbytes. Uh, today's webinar is entitled Sustainability 2.0, and with quite possibly the longest title in webinar history. Um, we are discussing corporate strategy, risk and responsibility in the age of mega hurricanes, burning forests, scorched fields, and a plasticized ocean food chain. So today's agenda, uh, we have the innovative concept of sustainability 2.0, the relationship between sustainability 2.0, uh, the UN SDGs and science-based targets, um, a strategy for sustainability 2, um, and the data needs of sustainability 2.0 strategy, and of course some questions at the end. So I'll quickly mention this before handing over um, to Colin Curtis. Um, so, as you can see here, um, there should be uh, the ability to ask questions uh, throughout the duration of the webinar, um, which will be an hour long. So, we we're hoping to be finished by um, 4 p.m. Um, GMT. Um, any questions that we don't get through, um, we will um, be in touch by email following the webinar. We're also going to record this webinar uh, within the next day or so. Um, we'll post it on our YouTube channel. Uh, you'll also get an email with a link um, so you can kind of share or revisit the presentation. So um, now we can start. Colin, it's over to you. Thank you very much, Callum. Much appreciated. Good afternoon to everybody, or good morning, depending where in the world you are. So my name is Colin Curtis. I'm a strategy consultant for Sustainit. I'm based in the UK. Um, before doing this, I was a former global head of sustainability at a, a rather large multinational um, IT company. And just to introduce Sustainit briefly, so Sustainit has been in existence since 2005. And for the past 12 years, what we've been doing is providing sustainability data management systems for uh, uh, for other organizations, we work with a, a large amount of the Fortune 100, and we specialize in software selection, in implementation, management, and strategy creation. So joining me today is Colin Grant, who is the CEO of Figbytes. Colin is a serial entrepreneur, as well as having a, quite a long background in, um, uh, in the sciences, particularly in biological sciences. Colin is a Scot and now a citizen of Canada, but rather confusingly is temporarily residing in France at the moment. So I'm assuming you're just there, Colin, is that right? Absolutely, I'm not sure if justice is what I deserve, but uh, you're certainly uh, describing me well. So, <laughs> hello to, hello to everybody. <laughs> and uh, thanks to everybody attending, it's great to see so many people here. <clears throat> so for the session, for the session we've got today, Colin and I have a, an awful lot of chats between ourselves and we, we want to try and kind of just keep this kind of nice and free and easy and have a bit of a conversation about things we care about, about what's going in in the world of sustainability and where organizations are moving to, where they need to be moving to, and how this lines to the SDGs, what businesses should be doing about it and how this relates to data. So we're, we're going to keep the kind of conversation quite interactive, but there'll be room for questions at the end of this. So I'm going to start off with a question for you, Colin. So we decided to call this webinar Sustainability 2.0 with a, a rather large and dramatic description of what that actually means afterwards. But can you maybe explain in your own words quite what you mean by Sustainability 2.0, why you feel that's important? Yes, I will uh, do my best. Can you see my screen now, Colin? Uh, not yet. Actually, I have just clicked. Let me know when my slide appears. No, not yet. It's saying people can see my screen. 
Callum, are you able to see my screen? Fantastic. That's good. Yes, I am now. Good to go. Yeah, so that's Brexit in action. <laughs> so, uh, so Colin, you and I, as you said, discuss sustainability a lot, and and we both have a lot of challenges with the the terms that we use to describe sustainability. Um, you know, we're not short of coming up with new terminology, new acronyms. Um, I'm going to make the case in the next 10 minutes that the concept of sustainability is in fact a misnomer. Um, so no challenge there, Colin. <laughs> um, and it was really redundant as soon as or before the term was actually coined. Uh, now, what I mean by this is that this is the world. These images are really from the last two months. And this is the world in which your corporations are trying to do business. Yours and my corporations are trying to do business. So this picture in the top left hand corner was what happened in British Columbia this summer where I live and the summer before last. The air was so bad that a friend of mine was visiting uh, in Seattle. She uh, was indoors and an alarm went off indoors from the outdoor uh, air quality or lack thereof. The bottom right hand corner is how the view from our house looked for about two months. Um, couldn't do any exercise because the air quality was, was Beijing-esque. Um, and this is really spectacular, the, the level of forest fires that we're seeing. And this was all over North America. So basically, um, you know, the last two months we had the west coast of North America on fire and the southeast underwater. And I think, Colin, you're just back from the U.S. Uh, dodging hurricanes and you know as I watched CNN and, and the fourth hurricane coming in I thought my god that looks just like the the, the shots from the day after tomorrow and of course as, as usual you search Google and somebody's beaten you to it um, but these are really you know we're hearing people on the news time after time describing these scenes as apocalyptic um, so this is the world in which we are trying to do business and uh, it's changing at a dramatic rate the question is, are our responses and our terms and our concepts that we use to try and address these changes uh, adequate? Now, Einstein would tell us, and, and I, if you were, if I could see you all, I'd be asking, uh, you know, put your hand up, um, you know, if you have uh, seen this at a conference or almost every conference that you've ever been at, and you'd probably all have your hands up. And we all chuckle as we look at it and we nod at the conferences. And unfortunately, we leave the conferences and we go back to our corporate environments and we go back to trying to solve the problems with the same type of thinking that created them. And Einstein just told us this would not work. So uh, as I try and uh, philosophize <laughs> for the next 10 minutes, I'm going to use this concept quite a bit. Um, I'm, as, you, as I said, uh, currently based in the French Alps, uh, famous in the winter for skiing and summer for cycle racing. Uh, there's a terminology um, in cycle racing. We have the breakaway group, we have the peloton, and we have the trailing group. Now, your corporations that you work for need to decide where you want to be. It's very comfortable to be in the middle here in the peloton, something like 40% less wind resistance. It's much more comfortable. We can be a laggard, and there's dangers there as well, or we can be in the breakaway group. Now, this concept applies to the science that we're trying to use to understand where we should be as corporations, as well as it does to uh, our corporate strategies. So perhaps the ultimate breakaway rider was, was Ray Anderson back in the 90s, uh, who, although he talked about climbing Mount Sustainability, recognized almost immediately once he'd had his epiphany and described himself as a plunderer and, and uh, you know, set himself out to uh, reform his, his company and his actions, um, realized that this was about becoming restorative we cannot sustain the type of images that we saw on that first slide of, of burning forests and plasticized ocean. You can't sustain that. We need to clean this mess up and we need to restore the damaged environment, which is now um, basically below the uh, carrying capacity of humankind. That is the challenge that we face. Interface now as a legacy for um, the late Ray's departure, have now reached the point where they are climate neutral, 100% uh, supplied by re renewable energy, and they're now entering the phase of restorative, climate restorative or climate take back, where they're going to take more carbon out of the atmosphere than they put in uh, as they do business. And an inconvenient truth, but very exciting concept is that every business, or at least the collective of every business, every city, every country, is going to have to become restorative 
by the middle of the century. It is not going to be enough to reach um, you know, um, quasi definitions of sustainability. We are in a different mindset now uh, and we're trying to adjust to that different reality that is becoming ever more obvious every time we switch on the news. So to defend this uh, concept that I've just put forward, um, scenes that we all saw um, coming from the southeast of, of the US, and those of us in Europe have seen this for a couple of decades now. When I first moved to Canada, people didn't know what I meant by catastrophic floods that, that uh, the UK and Europe had been hit by in the 90s. Uh, they just weren't aware that it happened. And it seems that only when it happens in your own backyard do you really wake up and, uh, and uh, smell the very unpleasant water. So who pays for all of this? Now, what's happened is that the insurance companies say, well, we can't pay. Capitalism immediately breaks down, just as it did in 2007, 2008, uh, when the bank said, well, capitalism isn't working anymore, could we have some socialism and a few trillion dollars in bailouts? The same thing is happening uh, with insurance companies. And I remember in the 1990s, I think it was Munich or Swiss Re uh, predicted that by 2050, uh, the value of the world's insurance claims would be greater than the world's GDP, and long before that, we'd be bankrupt. And that really seems to be playing out uh, quite horribly accurately in front of us. Uh, so if the government can't, sorry, if the insurance companies can't pay, we turn to the government. And there is another very inconvenient truth in here in that most governments in the world are bankrupt. They are leveraged beyond all uh, you know, um, uh, normality or, or, or sanity. And what we see is if we look at since the Nixon era, we've poured money into the economy and that has helped to drive the economy. And this looks like socialism to be not capitalism. So if we look at every um, US president, uh, we can see that the level of the Dow is directly proportional to the amount or the trillions of dollars in debt uh, that are poured into the US economy. So um, Donald Trump tells us that he's almost single-handedly going to get a Dow of, of 30. Um, if this holds true, and of course it won't because it's Donald Trump and he, he doesn't, uh, doesn't mean reality, but um, that would mean uh, a, a US debt of some $30 trillion. Just can't happen. So the government is not going to be able to bail us out. Now, this is the Embarcadero area of San Francisco. I spent many a good night down there, um, the Fisherman's Wharf area. And a study recently um, showed that in order to protect this area from uh, seismic uh, disasters, it was cost about $3 billion. And that's for three miles of the shoreline of San Francisco. When they took into account, I think, a reasonably... Um, uh, you know, conservative estimate of sea level rise that doubled to five to six billion dollars for three miles only of the coastline of one city. So where does that money come from? If the city doesn't have it and the government doesn't have it, you turn elsewhere. And what's happened is they've looked at fossil fuel companies. They've looked at the local fossil fuel companies. Of course, they are not directly responsible. Uh, you know, locally for uh, the local sea rise. But when we see titles like this, uh, headlines, 100 companies responsible for 71% of greenhouse gas emissions, that's where you're going to turn. So if we look at these names, ExxonMobil, Shell, BP, and Chevron, not surprisingly, they all are in the class or the, uh, the suit that uh, San Francisco and Oakland are filing. And similarly, we're seeing the same around in Marin and San Mateo uh, counties. So you've got to go, you've got to find the money somewhere. Where are you going to go? And this is where, if you are stuck in an old paradigm, uh, you, you can have done a materiality assessment, but it just doesn't take account of how fast things are going to go. Some very inconvenient truths. We've probably all seen this one. Um, there's, there's two misnomers. Uh, involved in the, in the Paris Accords. One is that two degrees is safe. That is not a scientific, uh, or you know, it's not a scientific statement. That is a political statement. Uh, the, the scientists didn't say it was safe. They were lobbied into making that type of statement. The other element is that uh, two degrees, the, 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 the Paris Accord uh, achievements uh, won't stop climate change. And we have almost no chance of achieving the Paris Accord. So two very inconvenient truths there. Now, uh, again, that kind of uh, Peloton versus breakaway group uh, metaphor I was talking about. This is Jim Hansen, formerly of NASA, now uh, at, um, 
a college professor and a part-time criminal who <laughs> gets arrested. Not the uh, guy who created the Muppets now. <laughs> Sorry, what's that? Not the guy who created the Muppets. No, that's Jim Henson. No, no, Apologies. No, another, okay. another one. Um, so Jim Hansen has kind of broken away from, from IPCC colleagues and has said things like um, about 10 years ago, if there wasn't a 100% moratorium on new coal fired and a, a phased out shutdown over the following decade within 10 years, uh, we had it. Um, and he's still making those statements and we haven't achieved those elements that, that he's talked about. The IPCC can't be that bold or, or um, uh, uh, you know, uh, aggressive in their statements. Uh, and again, we go to when we look at science-based targets which you're about to talk about colin we um you know go to the ipcc as the de facto scientific statements so that's a, a kind of flawed um, um strategy here so we also now see this kind of disney movie-esque plot where um uh, james is filing a lawsuit uh with his daughter and 21 other kids um you know james there with his uh, happy smiley professor face and his love of fedoras and they are suing the uh, US government. And this was in the Obama era, let alone in the Trump era. And again, we see the same usual companies coming forward saying, oh, we can't possibly do this because this would create an unprecedented restructuring of the economy and massive societal change. Now, I believe that that's what everybody in this uh, webinar today has been trying to achieve for their careers. Um, so maybe it's time for these companies to get out of the way and let that happen. So how much is enough? And this relates to this whole concept of where does the science come from? And I'm focusing at the moment on, on climate. I'll get to another aspect of, of unsustainable practices shortly. Um, but Colin, you and I were talking about you know, some recent examples of um, uh, companies that have, have stepped up and set themselves these big, hairy, audacious goals. Now, in the face of it, these statements by Mars look extremely ambitious. A billion dollars to be spent. We're going to create sustainability within a generation. And if we look here, we can see 60% greenhouse gas cuts by 2050. Now, I don't want to come down against Mars here. I think that's any organization, and I know most of you are kind of change agents trying to help the board, trying to help the CFO get this stuff. It's fantastic to get any kind of long-term goals like this. But if we were all only as good as Mars, 60% by 2050 will not save the living planet as we know it and, advanced, and an advanced human civilization. So as we make statements like sustainability in a generation, we've got to be careful because if our targets do not relate to the concepts of sustainability, um, you know, those, are, those, those uh, brand exposures are going to be quite dramatic, I think, in the future. And there's going to be a lot of transparency on this stuff. So well done, Mars, but I suspect you'll probably have to up those targets very shortly. And that's OK. Maybe this is a first step and uh, you know, a great step in the, in the right direction. Um, but the reality behind the science is, if you listen to Jim Hansen, he would say that we have to get back down to the atmospheric GHG content or CO2 content, the total GHGs uh, in which human civilization evolved. We can't survive uh, at higher levels. Now, we're at 400, and uh, the science-based target uh, and, and IPCC and Paris Accord uh, science is based on getting down to 450. 50 uh, parts per million. And that's not sustainable. We'll have to get down to 350 and we'll have to do it very quickly. And there are numerous studies that are showing that this is the case. It looks impossible and it is, again, uh, going back to Einstein, using the thinking that got us into this mess in the first place. But there may be ways of doing this. So if water is the new carbon, we hear that phrase, is plastic the new water? Um, so we're hearing that we are heading for a situation where we have more plastic in the ocean than fish by 2050. It's horrific and it is horrific to look at. Uh, who pays for this cleanup? And what is the responsibility? So we're seeing the Chevrons and BPs, uh, you know, facing huge challenges and lawsuits. How long before users of plastic uh, become subject to similar lawsuits? Um, so here we're saying just like, you know, um, ExxonMobil or Chevron knew uh, long before they admitted it uh, that this was a problem, perhaps Coca-Cola should have known as well. Now we are seeing great opportunities here, you know, Ecover are, are using uh, recycled uh, ocean plastic to make their bottles, Interface recycling uh, discarded fishing nets which are tangling out birds and making that into new flooring material. So they're great opportunities, but the scale of the cleanup 
that is required. It's described as a moonshot, just as the renewable energy transition is described as a moonshot. So we're facing multiple moonshots uh, you know, to be achieved by 2030 and then by 2050, uh, if we are to preserve life on Earth as we know it and advance human civilization. So what we're seeing is, is really nothing more or less than the tragedy of the commons being played out in front of us. I'm sure we've all studied this in our economics class. But at the end of the day, who is going to pay? Um, and this whole concept of sustainability 2.0, 3.0, uh, I don't really care too much about the titles. This is really about core business strategy. And it's not about the cycle that I see so many uh, people stuck in, which is um, you know, collecting data on an annual basis, creating the report, publishing the report, uh, losing lots of time in, in the spring every year, uh, you know, and, and working overtime, and then most stakeholders never reading that report. This really has to evolve beyond that and really impact the core business strategy of the organization. So I'm not gonna go through in the interest of time all of these bullet points, but the concept for me, for me is this is now core business strategy. It was for Ray Anderson and every organization is gonna to have to get to that point where they're gonna to have to accept a restorative footprint. Now, the wonderful news is that Moore's law is kicking in. Moore's law says that every three years we're getting a doubling of, of um, technology. So the technological, uh, technological solutions are coming at us uh, extremely quickly, but equally the rate of change of the challenges and problems that we're trying to address are running away ahead of us equally quickly. Can we solve this problem? I don't know, but I do know that we can't solve it using the type of thinking that got us into this mess. So if this isn't too much of a hospital pass for you, as we say in the soccer column, um, uh, given that everything that I've just described, uh, can you attempt at least <laughs> to uh, enlighten us on how science-based targets, flawed though they may be, or you may disagree, um, and elements like the UN Sustainable Development Goals can help us in this next stage of sustainability? I do feel like I've got the raw end of this deal here, though. What you're basically <laughs> saying is the world is going to hell in a handbasket, and what we're going to go and do about it. Um, exactly. Yeah, you make some really good points in there, Colin. Every time we chat about this, and we've covered it many, many times before, I think you are absolutely right. And the term sustainability is probably something that not many people on this call actually like. Um, there are many, many debates as to whether that's the right term, but I think that restorative term is absolutely key because this isn't actually just about making sure that we carry on doing things in the same way. This is actually about making things better because we, we generally have made the world a worse place. So I'm gonna talk about a few of the frameworks that I think are key for doing this and that I think in this world of sustainability 2.0, which is about actually trying to do something to go and improve the world rather than just improving our own organizations. I'll talk about three frameworks that are quite key. And to my mind, this is all about looking at the bigger picture. So first of all, the global goals, as I prefer to call them, or the SDGs, for those of us who like acronyms, the Sustainable Development Goals. Uh, I think these are fantastic. And I'm not used to saying this about things that come from the United Nations, but I think these are really, really good for several reasons. <clears throat> we have, firstly, they are so easy to go and understand. We have 17 nice, clear goals, technically 16, with a goal about partnership on there as well that are really kind of bright, easy to look at and easy to understand. And I find with this one simple slide that hopefully everybody can see, you can show this to your child, you can show this to your parents, to your friends, to your CEO, to your coworkers, to anybody at a university who's been educated, and everybody will look at this and they will get it. So they'll quickly look at this and go, you know what, these are all problems that we need to go and do something about. So you rapidly get a nodding of heads and it means that you don't have to spend three or four hours talking about what is sustainability, what's everyone doing about it, and you know exactly what issues we're trying to solve. Is it just green, is it financial, or what? So it talks about all these issues here. The other aspect I really like is the interconnectedness of these. So too often when we talk about sustainability, we focus on climate change. And that's absolutely right in many ways, because climate change has been described as the, the single biggest threat to mankind, and I, I do agree with that. But climate change is a result, it's not actually the problem itself. So we can't necessarily go and tackle the problem by just dealing with the problem. We've actually got to go and look at some of the root causes around this. And the root causes are several of these aspects here. It's the way we consume things. And it's actually the way we produce things as well. So concepts like the circular economy fit into this. It's how we actually all live together. 
So over half the world's population, 63%, live in cities now, and that number's increasing. So we've got to make sure that cities aren't areas that cause pollution and add to the problem, but actually take away from it. And inequalities and gender equality, I mean, if 50% if, if of the world's population aren't able to go and have an active voice in solutions to the problems, we're not going to deal with things. So we've got to look at all these things together. And the interconnectedness, I think, makes these SDGs particularly exciting. It does make it a challenge if you're ahead of sustainability, because reporting against these gets a little bit complicated. But I think that generates some really, really interesting discussions. And just the visual side of it, that, that means it's easy for people to understand. And going back to Colin's point originally, this is about the big picture of making the world a better place. This is not just about making our organizations better. The other aspect to look at on here is science-based targets. And I think Colin made a few compelling points that we can't always necessarily rely on science. So I'm going to both give a shout out to the concepts of science-based targets and why they're great, but I'm also going to inject a note of caution there. So on the positive side of science-based targets, they're based around science, which is really, really good. We actively need to look from a top-down way as to how we look at what problems we've got in the world today and how we need to go and restore it to make the world a better place. And we don't do that by doing things like saying we're going to reduce our GHGs by 20% per person by 2020, because it sounds really good. We actually have to go and look at what impact will it make if we reduce our GHGs, not just in our organization, but to the world as a whole. And that's what science-based targets do. So they look at where we are now. <clears throat> so back in 2013, there was about 34 gigatons of carbon in the air. Now it's about 35. Um, the IEA did a little bit of work that said in 2050, that's 15 gigatons, or we, we ideally want to go and have 15 gigatons of carbon in the atmosphere. And injecting that note of caution in there, 2050 is a long time away. We really want to be thinking much shorter term than that. There's a lot of evidence to go and show that if we haven't really reduced carbon significantly by 2020, we're going to struggle to make much impact. So we really need to get our skates on and do things quickly here. <clears throat> what science-based targets do is they break everything down by, in a number of ways, but one approach that they call a sectoral approach, basically looks at each industry and says, what do they contribute to the atmosphere in terms of carbon? So you can look at this and say, you know, for example, um, the power industry at the moment makes up about 40% of the carbon in the atmosphere. So you can look at your organization and say, roughly what percentage of that industry am I? So I can work out roughly how much I'm contributing to the world and see how much I need to go and reduce by. It is not an exact science. You're always going to be doing a little bit of kind of scientific equivalent of putting a wet finger in the air, but it's the best we can do. And science doesn't always give a lot of room for ambition. So sometimes I would say, instead of just saying, this is my slice of the pie that I'm going to work on, I would advocate for trying to stretch your targets and go a little bit beyond that as well. You can't Colin, always rely on the fact that other people, you know, will, will pull their weight. Yeah, and, and something that I spend quite a lot of time in Silicon Valley, and uh, the things that are happening down there are really quite incredible. Um, you know, I, I work with somebody who sits down with some of the, the tech titans down there, and companies like Google that are going way beyond, you know, their core business and really dramatically trying to change uh, the way that the world operates. You know, I'm hearing stories about uh, the ability to deliver uh, electricity through an Ethernet cable into a building now, of net zero buildings uh, existing just now. So Moore's law is kicking in, batteries are becoming 10 times more effective. Um, so the, the, the solutions are, are jumping forward. But another challenge I have with this approach is, you know, if you're in industry and, and you're running a, a tech company, um, you know, you're power system, you're, you're dependent on the grid and the grid has to change just as it does with transport. We can electrify transport, um, but there's utter independencies between all of these sectors. Um, you know, it, 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 you can't get one without the whole system changing and we need to look at whole system uh, or use whole system thinking and sustainability. Absolutely. Couldn't agree with you more, you know, and I think on that point, if we talk about something that I'm pretty sure most people on this call are familiar with, you know, on the whole concept of scope one, two, and three emissions, these have been really good, I think, at actually trying to add a little bit of science and analytics in how we go and measure emissions and how we make a difference in the world. 
Um, but I think to your point there, Colin, that they've been really bad at allowing us to go and think outside the box. So everyone got the idea of Scout One. So basically, the for those of you who aren't familiar, which I'm sure everyone is, Scout One being the emissions that you create by basically directly putting emissions up into the atmosphere from things you own, so burning things and the like, and Scout Two being emissions that come from any electricity used from your your power station that goes and feeds you. And people got those, and it was quite easy to go and do that. But I think everyone sat in the comfort zone for a little while, saying, as long as I measure my scope one and my scope two, the science is understood, everything's all good. But that's not system thinking. That's not system thinking in the slightest. We're not looking at the rest of our impact. And on your examples of Silicon Valley there, uh, Colin, I mean, the, I think Google is, uh, is a good example, as is someone like Apple. So Apple is doing some fabulous work to go and move things like its own campus to 100% renewable energy. Yep. But really where it makes the biggest difference is actually in the products that it sells to us and where it gets those products from. Mm -hmm. And I think I'm more excited about the fact that they said, let's look at how we can go and create our products without actually mining anything out of the ground. Yep. And I admire that because they've, they actually don't have a clue how they're going to go and do this. Mm -hmm. or maybe they've got a clue, but they've said, you know, wouldn't it be great if we can go and do that? Let's go and have a look into it and let's share our journey with people. So they can go and learn from that. And that's, in my mind, that's ambition. And, and, if we, and that's also what Einstein would have said we have to do. We need to go beyond what we believe or know to be possible into the realms of the impossible, um, you know, or, or, or barely possible, just as uh, John Kennedy did in the, the 60s with the, the moonshot. Exactly. Or with Elon Musk with a Hyperloop, you know. And yeah. Yeah. Looking yeah. at the concept of saying, let's try and come up with tomorrow's technology to solve a problem rather than try and solve a problem using today's technology. Yeah. Good way of doing it. But scope three emissions, which is a bit that I think many of us have sat there and kind of shivered a little bit of the idea of because they're, we've got these 15 categories that are all quite difficult to go and tackle. These are the things we need to get on with. And I would, I think it's made difficult by the fact that some of these categories are almost impossible to go and measure. So I think you have to go and pick the ones that are important and impactful, but, you could, but are really things that you can start to tackle straight away. And I would advocate things like purchase goods and services, transportation, both upstream and downstream, and use of sold products, depending on what organization you're in. If we're to look at, say, services industries of any kind, you know, they have very little scope one and scope two emissions. Generally, their offices and travel but they purchase quite a lot of goods and they will often go and sell them onto their clients as well. So being able to go and look at the impact of what they sell and the impact of what they buy, that's, that's really gonna start making a difference. Now, I'll take an example of an organization that I've been doing some work with that works in the paper industry. So they provide paper-based products. They don't make the paper, but they provide it to a lot of very big organizations. So they've been working with a lot of the paper mills to actually try and understand what the environmental impact is of that paper and then trying to work with their clients to try and make them aware of that. So they're helping their clients to go and understand what the impact is of the products that they're actually using, and then using that to go back to their suppliers and say, how can you go and improve that? Now that's having an impact. That's a smaller organization, that's virtually no scope one, scope two, but because of the size of companies they're working with, they're doing really well with that. So Colin, um, how do you propose that an organization tries or uh, hopefully succeeds in setting and achieving a strategy in this time of extreme flux and challenge? Now, that's a good question. I think that's the really important bit here. Um, I think to start off with, if we just look at some of the basics, so it's got to be about actually understanding what matters for your business and making sure that your strategy is aligned with what your business does. So, and some of that comes back to good old fashioned materiality. As you can see on the slide here, you know, we've got a, a fairly typical materiality matrix. And what we're measuring is the impact on the company on the X axis and what the stakeholders think of this on the Y axis. And on that, we map all the different issues that may affect the company according to what they do. But I would always advocate to go and focus on the things that are really key about that company. So if you are Apple, then you don't just want to think about your buildings, you want to think about the phones that you sell. You know, if you're in this case Nestle, you want to think about who provides to you and who you sell these products to. So I would say that's a starting point. 
I would also, in terms of we were mentioning about the SDGs, relate this into the SDGs as well. So go and look at not just what you do within your business, but which of the global goals you can actually go and prioritize. Mm -hmm. So if you feel that partnering with others is key, and make sure that's prioritized on there. If you feel that actually providing decent working conditions is key, and you prioritize that. And again, you can map this in a form of SDG materiality matrix. Yeah, and, and what this does, Colin, is provides this common language and common ground between all the partners that need to come together in order to achieve sustainability. I believe a, a key element in sustainability 2.0 is going to be, I mean, just think about Silicon Valley. You have the city of Palo Alto that's agreed to an 80% GHG cut by 2030. You have, uh, you know, it's, it's really unfashionable now to be a tech company and not committed to or using 100% renewable energy. Shouldn't, you know, uh, uh, Apple and, and, um, and uh, Salesforce be teaming up with their local cities and then teaming up with the state plan. And then we're seeing the Californian state plan immediately when uh, Mr. Trump said that, uh, the U.S. was no part, um, was no longer part of the Paris Accord. Um, we saw Governor Brown immediately le reaching out to the Chinese and saying, "Can we join you in the race to the top, not the, uh, the the race down to the bottom?" So this collaboration is going to be a critical component, I believe, going forward. And the SDGs really give this common language and and, uh, and common visualization of what we're trying to achieve. That's a good point. So Cambridge Institute of Sustainable Leadership described the SDGs as the, the nearest thing we've got as a strategy for mankind. So I think we all owe it to that strategy to go and get behind that, and as you say, to go and speak that common language. Yes, I think indeed. one thing we all need to go and do, and this is something that's often missed, I think, when we set in sustainability strategies, is just to make sure we take everybody on that journey with us. And that isn't necessarily just about trying to make your arguments with large it's about trying to engage people's passion behind it as well. So, and I'll, I'll use an analogy that a colleague of mine in human resources actually taught me here. Um, I always find this very powerful. And if you imagine the concept of a rider sat on an elephant, and if the rider represents logic and it represents the brain on there, the rider may be sat on top of the ele ele elephant, it may have the reins. So theoretically, it may be in control. But we all look at this image and we all know that the elephant, if he wants to go and do something of its own, then it will just go and wander off. And the elephants represent our emotions in this. So it's very important to make sure that the emotions are fully engaged in anything. And then we just go and confirm everything we're doing with logic. It has to be emotions first. And as you're all speaking to your leaders, I'd always bear that in mind. Is understand what they care about. Try and help them go and care about this. Try and help them be passionate about it. And not just your leaders, if you try and think of your customers as well, make sure that emotional engagement comes first. The logic has to be there as well to go and back at the arguments. But I think we can all often be too guilty of talking about scope one, scope two, scope three emissions, SDG targets and all these kind of things. Whereas in truth, it's got to be the stories about why these things are important. And as Colin started off with at the beginning of this webinar here, just to go and explain the impact we've got, they don't necessarily have to be scare stories. You know, they can be things about what we're doing positively, you know, and the good stories about how we can all make a difference and, and actually are making a difference. But let's make sure that emotions have a good part to go and play in this. And the last thing I would say on strategies here as well is make sure you set a big, hairy, audacious goal. Um, targets that talk about GHG savings and everything like that, they're OK, they're good. But I would advocate that you really want a target that's simple so that anybody can understand it. So that your CEO can stand there, can stand up and they can repeat this with passion. And they can be fully behind this and that people can look at it and go, yep, that makes complete sense. I get that. This organization is doing something really good. But you also want to add a level of complexity in that as well. So the statement has to sound simple, but you're actually going to have to do something really complex to go and meet it. And as an example, Unilever originally set the targets of being able to go and double its revenue and half its environmental impact. And that's a really simple statement we can all get behind. But if you look at it, there's a lot of complexity about being able to go and decouple financial success from environmental reduction in there as well, as well as having to go and understand exactly what do we mean by environmental impact. So think about those big, hairy, audacious goals that are things that your leadership can stand up there and say, and that really kind of challenge you to go and do more. 
So I talked for a little while on strategy, and I guess one thing that probably a lot of people on this call are wondering is, if we have a strategy like this in place, how do we actually make sure that we're performing well, and how do we get the data around that? And maybe Colin, if you can give a few views on that. Yeah, and maybe if you can just tell me when my slide reappears. So I'm going to start talking in the hope that it does appear. Ah, okay, I've now been offered the ability to show my screen. So the huge challenge that we see uh, every time we encounter a problem is death by 1990s tools, software tools. Um, as we launch a 21st century strategy, is PowerPoint the best way to do that? And the answer is absolutely not. PowerPoint is useful. It's a great tool for what we're doing just now. It is a terrible tool in which to try and communicate a multi-level, um, highly nuanced strategy. Uh, how many, I mean, think about, I've seen Al Gore talk, when you come out of it, how much can you actually remember? Well, there was a lot of scary stuff and some good stuff and they talked a lot. We just can't remember it. We need to be, this is the equivalent of having a map, um, you know, in the 18th century as we, as we try and navigate um, and, and totally separate from our compass bearings. Uh, when I used to go hiking and climbing mountains in the, the 1970s, I remember wet, soggy maps that you hope didn't fall apart as you climbed the mountain, uh, you know, inside a plastic case covered in water as the rain poured down. The map has to be clear. It has to be visible at all times. We can't just close the map and expect people to remember where we're trying to get to. And then we see, um, you know, the, the kind of typical 1990s type EHS tools based around compliance. This is now beyond, I, I suspect that most organizations attending today are way beyond compliance. Yes, you still do need to tick those boxes, but you need to be able to see your strategy and these tools just don't do that. So what we see is the cycle of, you know, really collecting the data on an annual basis, exporting it from the EHS system into Excel, trying to marry that Excel up with the PowerPoint strategy, creating a PDF document, putting it on your website and hoping that, that stakeholders will read it. And unfortunately, and I get this confirmed by so many sustainability and CSR people I speak to at conferences, sometimes with tears in their eyes saying, people just don't read my report. And I know how much effort was into it, but we've moved beyond that. Think about how we communicate now compared to the 1990s. My kid uses tools that, that I don't even understand and, and, and I'm terrified of, but they don't, talk, they, don't, they don't read books, the next generation coming through uh, in general. They don't use words, they use icons. And Colin, you talked about how the SDGs were really powerful. They are powerful because they're icons, they are not small books. Uh, now what happens unfortunately is we're in such a habit of producing a report that we create another report and another set of deck, uh, another set of slides uh, to communicate our progress against uh, the, the global goals. This all has to be integrated seamlessly and it all has to relate to a strategy. So when we were dis uh, designing FigBytes, we looked at all the things that corporations were trying to do, create a strategy, integrate it with the core business strategy, pressure test that strategy with materiality. Now, just there, think about if your strategy is in PowerPoint and your materiality is in a combination of PowerPoint and Excel, you're then trying to flick all of this together like a, a Las Vegas uh, dealer and, and shuffling a pack of cards and electronic cards, it just doesn't work. And then the performance needs to be in real time. One of our clients is Akamai Technologies. They're the largest web services company in the world. I think about um, 20 to 30% of the world's web traffic goes through their servers every day. We're gathering their uh, GHGs right down to the switch and sub-server component level across 92 countries and I think um, 3,600 data centers. Uh, so you've got to be able to gather that data, but you have to make compelling, engaging, exciting, passionate sense. And the stories are every bit as important and how we present those stories are critically important. And I believe that these massive challenges of addressing the global commons can only be achieved by corporations or by corporations taking their part if we can instantly create brand value by our good deeds. About 80% of a company's brand these days relates to its social and environmental performance or ESG performance. 
but we're not capturing that brand value by writing a small book of 60 pages and publishing it every year. Um, if, if anybody wants to read my uh, blog on uh, the, the Fig Bites website uh, about my uh, slightly inebriated <laughs> experiment I did in a uh, Mexican restaurant in San Francisco earlier this year where I went round and asked table after table of millennials, have you heard the term CSR? Yes, customer services representative. One girl said it's CSR. I know this, it's CSR. One out of about 50 millennials. I asked her, do you know a company that excels in CSR? This was in San Francisco, probably the greenest city in, in uh, North America or certainly in the US. And she drew a blank. So these messages are not getting through. And it's because we're using 19th, uh, you know, 20th century uh, tools to try and communicate 21st century concepts. So uh, very briefly, Figbytes allows you to map out your strategy, take your pillars, build them in, in beautiful simplicity is our tagline. You can pressure test that strategy with materiality all in one place, not jumping between PowerPoint and Excel and all these different tools. You can map your strategy from your long-term goals right down to your monthly KPIs. You can create scorecards uh, that uh, are, are data driven. As I say, on a monthly basis, we're giving Akamai Technologies their GHGs uh, right across all scopes. And you can then relate those to the uh, global goals, if you like, and also create video uh, in here, build video in here. Now, this type of living report is the future of reporting. Uh, the only tears that have ever left my eyes when I've read a typical sustainability report are tears of boredom. I have to be honest here. Um, but when I watch corporate videos showing how supply chains are changing, how people in, in disadvantaged communities are, are having their lives improved by the actions of corporations, I get tears of joy in my eye. This is what we need to harness and the tools that we use uh, in the 21st century and, and uh, in this advanced stage of sustainability, call it 2.0, call it whatever we want, really have to be very, very different. We've got to capture that energy. It's got to come into real time and it's got to capture the passion and commitment. Uh, again, uh, SDGs, are they going to become another set of, of slides or can you integrate those directly into your strategy, your tactics, every part of what you do? And then this whole concept of brand, how, why would a Pepsi or, or a Coke or a Unilever uh, take on the massive challenge and expense of taking their part in cleaning up the oceans? They will only do that if they can get brand value and they need to get that brand value in real time. So Figbytes also creates these, uh, what we call data-driven storytelling uh, views. Um, and, and this really helps the organization to move beyond this 1990s concept of retrospective reporting to stakeholders. It's a horrible term. Let's think about real-time brand enhancing engagement with people. Fantastic. Okay. I love those, some of those pictures on there as well, because I think it, it really brings it to life what an organization is doing. And as you say, the pictures tell the story so much better than trying to troll your way through a sustainability report. Yeah. Great. And we often call and think that the pictures really appeal to, to children. I mean, one, one client says, this is the first time that my CEO got this. So, you know, if we're trying to get CEOs and especially CFOs on board who just weren't trained and probably you know, they're, 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 they haven't evolved to think in these areas. If you think about, you know, no two human brains are alike. Uh, and, and some people are very objective and, and, uh, and, and, and uh, data based, but almost everybody gets pictures. That's why we drew on, on cave walls. That's why we've created beautiful art. Sustainability has to become and can become beautiful art. And that art can be driven by data in real time. Absolutely. And we, we have to remember our job is not is not to go and make ridiculously kind of detailed data. Our job is to go and spur people into action. That's literally all it is. You know, because if we get our data accurate, but we don't engage anybody, we don't drive progress. Yeah. It's a lot of sense. Thank you, Colin. Okay, you. at this point, we've been talking for quite a while now. So what we want to go and do is open up for any questions. You can enter any questions in the questions bar on, um, on your go to webinar control panel. So, do please, uh, do please ask away. Okay, brilliant. Um, firstly, thank you both very much um, for your presentation. Um, it was both fascinating and, and harrowing 
all at the same time. So hopefully uh, all the attendees um, enjoyed the content. And while we're waiting for a few more questions to trickle in, we have had some um, during the course um, of the webinar. So uh, Colin, Colin, if you guys are ready, um, I will fire a couple over. Please do. Okay, so we've um, got a couple uh, relating to the SDG. So I'll start with uh, one that isn't. Um, and uh, apologies um, on behalf of whoever asked it, if it's a bit too broad, um, but I thought it might be a good one to kick off with. Um, so question is as follows. Uh, if Mars is not there yet, as in Mars the company, um, what is your best advice for building moonshot targets? <laughs> That's a good one. Colin, do you want to go for that one as you talked about Mars? Uh, I'll give it a go. Um, I mean, it's a huge challenge. As I said, I, I respect any organization that, that manages, because I, I know what most of you out there are, you want to be change agents. Often, um, you know, far too much of the time, you're, you're data chasers, data crunches, and, and nagging ants trying to get people to, to do things. I call you the nag and drag and bag officer. So uh, nagging will do the right stuff, trying to drag the information back and trying to bag it into a report that most people won't read. Um, so, so to get that level of change where a corporation can commit to something like dramatic, 65% uh, GHG cuts is fantastic. Um, you know, I, I believe that the organizations that don't go ambitious enough will cease to exist over the next couple of decades. And again, that's a very dramatic statement. We've just seen the, uh, a remake of the movie Blade Runner. Uh, in the original Blade Runner, um, this was a, you know, a futuristic vision of a city and you saw all these adverts up on, on the, uh, you know, the cityscape. And these brands were supposed to be ones that could not possibly fail and would, would have to survive into the future. And I think most of them had gone within you know, a decade or two of Blade, the original Blade Runner coming out. So companies that don't move far enough and fast enough are heading for trouble. Uh, again, you know, Mars want to get out of um, you know, um, plantations and, and uh, you know, rainforest harming activities with, with palm oil. How quickly are you going to do that? And what are your liabilities if you don't go as quickly as you possibly can? So, you know, I think it's, it's looking at when you do these materiality assessments, um, you know, fascinated to hear your uh, input in this, Colin, but often they get kind of dumbed down. And often it's the finance people who say, okay, show me the return on this. And there's the risk and there's a the return. But if the science isn't strong enough, then the risk will be undervalued, which I think is what has happened to these oil companies. Um, I, I attended the GRI conference in Amsterdam in, I think, 2008. And Shell did a private unveiling of their sustainability plan, and they just launched a plan. If you remember that graph of what the GHGs of the world have to do, they launched in their plan their new policy that said, we're moving from a policy of reducing our GHGs to a policy of a more pragmatic, I quote, policy of, uh, of being in the top 10 uh, uh, in, in our uh, industry. And the graph hockey sticked up from diminishing GHGs to rapidly expanding GHGs. And I kind of asked, does anybody else feel like <laughs> I'm in entirely the wrong room here? Um, and everybody looked at me like it was, um, um, you know, a, a kind of weirdo. Uh, and I remember thinking that the, the, the liability that you unleash for yourself when you say, if you know that climate change is happening, and if 100 companies are responsible for climate change, and you want to be one of the 10 least bad uh, uh, offenders, and your GHGs are going to go up dramatically, that for me was an epitaph for, for, for the planet. And I, I, you know, I was just absolutely shocked watching it. And I'm not surprised now to see these decisions coming back and biting the organizations. So to summarize, um, you know, there is a risk going too far and, and pushing as change agents beyond where your executives and board are, are prepared to go. There's also enormous risk for them in not going far enough, quickly enough. Thank you very much. Um, so looking at the time, we've got roughly three minutes um, left. Um, so I, what I'm going to do is combine uh, two of the questions that we had through uh, relating to the SDGs. And just so I'm not showing any signs of having a favorite, I'll ask this one to you, Colin Curtis. Um, and this is, um, <laughs> so if the SDGs are the questions, uh, ambitions to be reached, 
how should companies then translate the 244 UN indicators to show both negative and positive impacts? So the other question also related around this kind of measurability of the SDGs. So maybe if you could speak for a few minutes about what companies or governments are doing um, to put these into action in a bit more detail. Sure, yeah. And I'm very conscious of time, so I will answer this one in one word. Don't. <laughs> um, so, so there are 244 indicators, technically 232, and 12 that overlap as well, because uh, they, they doubled up on these indicators for some weird reason, and 169 targets. My advice is just focus on the goals. Um, that is going to be terrible to all those data junkies out there, because we, we do like the idea of measuring against these. but. I think it's important to try and align what you do against the top level goals first of all and just not spend too much time reporting against the individual targets. Um, they were designed for governments, they weren't designed for businesses and if you can easily report against them then by all means do but I would really advocate that most of the effort should be spent getting people on board against the goals, reporting against those and doing so in a way that kind of catches people emotionally rather than spending too much time putting science against all those 232 indicators. Um, I've tried it. I have tried it, and I'm a member of the UK um, Stakeholders for Sustainable Development, and we're looking at mechanisms in which we should try and do this at a country level. And it's hard. But I think for an individual business, it's probably more important just to go and look at the top-level goals. So you know, talk about the stories on how you are doing something on climate action, gender equality, et cetera and just make sure it matches the, the targets and the spirit of the goal, but don't go into too much detail. If I could add 30, with me. 30 seconds worth to that, Colin. We're just about to start with our first country in the Middle East, uh, mapping all of the impact of all of the charities yeah. uh, against the, uh, the, the global goals. The key thing that I would recommend is use these to advise to make sense of your strategy or, or further sense of your strategy, but don't take these as a strategic platform. They were not really intended to be. And, and we mix up this term goals with targets. These are kind of desired outcomes. The goals should be driven by your strategy. And then these uh, global goals or, or uh, sustainable development goals, uh, you know, match them to your strategy, but don't be driven by them. Fantastic. Well, thank you both very much for that. And again, thank you for um, your time this afternoon. Um, that's both Colin Curtis um, and, of course, Colin Grant from Figbytes. So, um, yeah, if you guys want to say um, your goodbyes, um, we will end the presentation. Thank you, everybody. Good Goodbye. Everybody. Keep doing your good work.